Hello, welcome to our lesson um, for chapter one, Yamago Dei, or being created in the image of God. Um, the topic of this chapter is the idea that we're created in the image of God, and therefore we all have inherent human dignity. Um, the lecture you're going to get is the entire lecture for chapter one. If you miss class, you may not need to watch all of this because um, it took place over um, about three class periods, whereas today I'm going to do it all in one go. So you see here, um, these are the page numbers in the textbook that you're responsible for, um, 36 through 38, 41 through 48, 52, 50 through 52, and 58 through 59. And then um, these are the scriptures that we're studying this, this uh, chapter. So Genesis 1, Genesis 2, 4 through 24, Psalm 139, 1 John 4, 7 through 21, and then finally Matthew 5, 43 through 47. Um, we're going to study these by um, reading them and answering questions, and they'll also be on your quiz. So let's continue. All right, the chapter one learning objectives are to define um, Human dignity, imago dei, which is Latin for the image of God, nihilism, hylomorphic, materialism, and determinism. Now, it's important that you take notes because some of these vocabulary words are in the book, but some of them I'm supplementing. Um, our next objective is to be able to give examples from Scripture of humanity's unique role in creation. Um, next, to explain what it means to say human dignity is inherent invaluable, and inalienable. So you're going to need to know what that means in these different cases. And then finally, to describe what it means to be authentically human. At the start of every chapter, we always look at an example of a moral dilemma. I've been using um, Harvard X's uh, examples that they use for their justice class. So in class, we saw, um, watched a video, and then discussed the morality of um, uh, the morality of whether or not um, some human lives should be valued more than others. So if you go to Schoology and um, you took a look, whoops. So if on Schoology, this is chapter one, and you went to classwork and discussions, um, chapter, classwork 1.7, chapter 1, lesson 1, warm-up. So this was the video we watched. Um, it wasn't an assignment um, that you had to do. It was something we did as a large group in class, and everyone got credit for it. So we watched this video, which if you want to, you could click the link and watch it. And um, then on the board, we discussed whether or not it was right or wrong um, and the implications of the case. Um, and we'll be doing that for every chapter from now on. So, and again, that just happened as a large group. You don't have to make it up if you were absent. Moving on. Um, the first part of your book has this section called Act Human. Um, it's on pages, whoops, give me a second here. On pages uh, 36 through 36 through 38. Um, when I first read it, it was something I kind of thought about skipping, but the, um, the tips they give you are different things to keep in mind as we continue studying morality. So the first tip they gave us is everyone doesn't have to like us. Um, so what they mean by this is our value is not based on the opinion of others. So our value doesn't come from what other people think about us, so it's okay if we disagree. As we continue discussing morality, we're not all gonna agree with each other, and just because someone doesn't agree with you doesn't mean you're of lesser value. Um, it's okay to make mistakes. This seems like um, it's self-explanatory, but our culture is a culture that values perfection. And oftentimes we don't um, cut ourselves slack or cut others slack. We all make mistakes and so does everybody else. Um, it's important that we own up to them, but also that we allow ourselves to um, you know, not be just destroyed by our mistakes. 
Other people are okay and so are you. So what they mean by this is people are basically gonna do what they wanna do. Just because someone does something that you don't like doesn't make them a bad person. Um, you know, just because people do things that we don't agree with, again, that single action isn't their deti doesn't determine their entire value. So keep that in mind as we continue. You don't have to control everything. Um, again, not everybody's going to like what you do. You're not going to like what everybody else does, um, but you're not, you don't have to be in charge of everything. Um, we're responsible for how we feel and what we do. Oftentimes, we act as if our emotions control us. So if we're having a bad day, perhaps we take it out on everyone around us. But just because you're feeling bad doesn't give you the right to take that out on everybody else. You need to control your feelings and then control the way your feelings in, in, uh, influence your behavior. It's important to try. This is another one in, uh, that's important. In morality, oftentimes, we're dealing with ideals. Ideally, no one would have sex outside of marriage. Sometimes ideals seem impossible to achieve. But if God thought they were impossible, he wouldn't have expected them of us. So it's important to try to reach those ideals. Again, we're going to make mistakes, but that doesn't mean to give, you should give up. And finally, we are capable of change and can change. Especially in light of the resurrection, this is important to remember as Christians. In our society, we have the expression, a leopard can't change its spots. Well, as Christians, we believe that that's just plain false. Um, Jesus died and gave us the grace so that we could um, overcome sin, so we could overcome our mistakes and our differences. So through God's grace, um, can I change on my own? No, I can't do it on my own. But through God's grace, I can change. I can change my spots and become a better person. So if I can do that, so can others. Um, and that's important to keep in mind. Um, the next thing we did in class was to do classwork um, 1.9 Humanity Handout. Um, this handout's purpose was to kind of give you the ability to take some time and consider how you view uh, humanity. So if I take you to our page, uh, excuse me. And again, we're, this is chapter one. And we go to classwork and discussions for chapter one. 1.9 humanity handout. Um, if you are absent, you need to complete this and then um, email it to me. So students downloaded this uh, PDF and put it into notability and filled it out. First, you rank which of these statements. Um, so which of the statements do you agree with based on a one to nine uh, one to eight scale. Then down here, I had, whoops, uh-oh, there we go. Down here, then you have, I had the students for where it says which philosophies are compatible with Christianity, which are not, I had students put a plus or a minus mark. So for example, look out for number one, I'm number one. Is that compatible with Christianity? We would put a minus mark because no, it's not. Do to others as you would have them do unto you. We would put a plus mark because that is compatible with Christianity. And here I had the students put why. What was the factor that made you say something is compatible or incompatible with Christianity? So, for example, you might say, um, I based it on the golden rule or something like that. Then you have to put your own life philosophy, um, a brief statement like one of these. And then finally, according to the philosophies you ranked one through eight, how would you handle in the following cases? You witnessed shoplifting was number one. You see a mother abusing her child, number two. And then number three, you, a class, you hear a classmate make a racial slur. So you should have three bullet points here saying how you would handle those following cases. Um, so again, if you are absent, please complete this and um, make sure you get that turned in. All right. So human dignity, that's the topic of this chapter. So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, um, what is human dignity? And... Um, Hang on, let me pause this for a sec. 
Oh, excuse me, this slide is out of place. I'm gonna go to the next slide. We should have started. So human dignity. Um, dignity is the quality of having, um, of being worthy of esteem and respect. Having dignity means that we have worth and value. So one of the expressions we have in American culture is you have to earn respect. Um, as Catholics, the reason why we have dignity and value is because we exist. God created us. So you don't actually earn respect from the Catholic perspective. Um, human dignity and respect is inherent, invaluable, and inalienable. What that means is, first of all, it's inherent. It's an essential characteristic of being human. So this is something that's definitive. It's a definitive characteristic of humanity. So again, you don't earn it. It's inherent. It's invaluable, which means no one has the right, the right to profane or violate it. So now, is it possible for people to violate someone else's dignity? Yes. For example, um, rape would be a violation of someone's human dignity because it uses a person as an object. Um, but uh, no one has the right to do that. That's part of the reason why many actions are considered inherently immoral is because they violate human dignity. Finally, it's inalienable, meaning it cannot be taken away away by anyone. So again, in the example of um, rape, sometimes women who are raped feel like their dignity has been stolen from them. But um, in truth, because your dignity comes from God, um, you, even though you might feel that you've lost your dignity, um, your dignity can't be taken from you. God gave it to you and nobody can rob you of it. Another important point is to know that sin does not erase our dignity. So sin does not erase it. It distorts it, but it doesn't um, destroy our human dignity because, again, God gave it to us. So another thing that sometimes people will say is that, for example, somebody who murdered someone, they forfeited their dignity. They lost their right to life because they took a life. Um, and uh, the Catholic understanding, because dignity comes from God and it's inalienable, someone who would say dis rape or kill someone distorts their own human dignity, um, but they um, don't lose it because of their actions. So another important principle of Catholic moral teachings is everyone is a someone. We cannot treat people as objects or a means to an end. So a means to an end would be um, using person as a person as an object or as something to, um, uh, for example, um, uh, when we talk about why pornography is wrong, it's because we use people as a means to an end. The end is sexual gratification, and you use other people to accomplish that. So it, another principle just to keep in mind is that um, we cannot use people as objects. When we do that, it, uh, it violates their human dignity and is always immoral. So again, inherent, invaluable, inalienable, this will be all be on your quiz, and so will this principle. Um, is it okay to use people as a means to an end? No. You can never use a person as a means to an end, no matter how good the end, the end is the outcome. Whoops. No ma matter how good the outcome, you can never use people as a means to accomplish good ends. Here. So um, we're starting here with classwork, um, classwork, 8.1 Imago Day scripture stations. What this was was a um, an assignment where you um, were given the scriptures and you had to look them up and answer questions. So make sure you go on um, Schoology and 
Uh, do this assignment if you were absent. So I just want to point that out. We started with looking at Imago Day in scriptures, and then we went from there. So um, just wanted to point that out. Now let me go back to the next page, or the first page. Okay, so we looked at the scriptures. Um, oops. We looked at uh, the particular scriptures listed on the first page um, of of the um, lecture. So make sure you know those. Um, and let's review um, what we take away from those readings. So we share in God's life through using our God-like qualities. So God is love. That's what it said in First John, right? So God is love. Since we're created in the image of God, we were created by God's love for love. Who, what is God? If you think about God, it's the Father, or He is the Father, and the Son. They're eternal and outside of time and space, and they have this eternal loving embrace. That loving embrace, their love is the Holy Spirit. And this is happening eternally in the same moment all the time. And um, the love between the Father and the Son produces the Holy Spirit. Think about the analogy to the human people. You have a father and a mother, whoops, and a mother, and their love creates a third person, the child. So we can see that in the same way the love between the Father and Son creates the Holy Spirit, the love between a father and a mother creates the child. Men and women were made for each other. We saw that in Genesis 1. It said, in the image of God, um, male and female were created. Why does the Bible mention male and female? Because it's in Genesis 1, it's showing um, that we were meant to be sexually different. And then after that, it said, God commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. So that's called the procreative dimension. Genesis 1 teaches us that it's part of human nature to have sexual difference, and the reason why we're sexually different is for procreation. Then in Genesis 2 and 2, we learned that God created Eve from Adam's rib, and it says that's why um, at, that man leaves his father and mother and two become one flesh. So this is the unitive property. Unitive. So we were created for two purposes, male and female to be procreative and male and female to be unitive. So those are the two dimensions of human um, nature, that men and women were created uh, for each other to be procreative and also to unite um, as, as one body. Uh, we're also reminded of our need, uh, that we need to be humble. Um, we're created in the image of God, but again, that gives us a lot of um, importance and value, but we also need to be humble before our creator. Also, over and over in Genesis 1, it said that the creation is good. Um, and then at the very end, when human beings were created, it says um, that we were very good. So... Um, Catholics understand that ultimately creation is good. We were created to be good, but we fell out of God's likeness. So we're still created in the image of God, but we don't always act like it, do we? So Catholics have a very high value of humanity in our place in creation. Um, we're ultimately good, but because of the fall, um, we, uh, we have original sin. And remember, original sin is that condition um, that makes us weak and vulnerable to sin. So we want to have balance and acknowledge our goodness, but also the sort of broken and fallen, fallen nature of humanity. But again, this fallen nature is overcome by grace. And where do we get grace? The sacraments. So God gave us the cure for original sin. We merely have to... Um, receive it, and use it in our lives. Now, this would be in opposition to nihilism. Nihilism is the idea that ultimately life has no meaning. 
Um, it comes as a result of um, post-enlightenment, when you look at some of the extent existentialists, like Thoreau, and then later um, people like Sartre, uh, they ultimately decided that life doesn't really have any value, it doesn't have any meaning, um, but as Christians, we would say, no, we have amazing value because we're created in the image of God. God created the earth out of love because um, he wants us to have, a, wants to have a relationship with us. So um, ultimately, Christianity is, opposes this idea of nihilism. Um, so let's go to the next slide. All right, our spiritual nature. So our, we started off with we're creating the image of God. We looked at some of the places that that is in Scripture. Another important aspect of, the, of understanding what it means to be human is we have a spiritual nature, not just a material nature. So we have this sort of dissatisfaction with being merely a physical thing. Um, so... Uh, we are hylomorphic beings. Hylomorphic means that we have a spiritual nature. So spirit. And a material nature. So I have a body. And I have a soul. Another word you can use for the soul is your mind or consciousness. And there are three faculties of the soul. There's your intellect, your will, and then your desires or appetites. So if you're a materialist, materialism denies the spirit. It says that we're only a material body. So a strict materialist would not only deny that we have souls, it would also ultimately deny that you have a mind or a consciousness. That's merely an illusion that you are uh, hallucinating, but it doesn't actually exist. As Christians, we believe, no, there is, the mind does exist, and it will continue to exist after death, um, and we also have a body. And both are important and essential to what it means to be a human being. So um, St. Augustine wrote, You've made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Um, this restlessness um, that we try to fill with other things, it could be power, money. Maybe you think, well, if I just go to college, then I'll be happy. If I just get the right job, then I'll be happy. If I just marry the right person. And we can fill our lives with all kinds of different things, and they may satisfy for a moment, but at the end of the day, the part of us that's not material, the soul, longs for its source, which is God. And unless we um, have a relationship with God, that longing will never be satisfied. Um, another way it was expressed was by Blaise Pascal, who said, we have a God-shaped hole in our heart. If you don't fill that hole with God, you will never be satisfied. We are not merely physical beings, material beings. We have a soul um, that longs uh, for its creator. So our souls also make us special. We talked about the faculties of the soul, the intellect, the will, and the appetites. So we have the ability to think and use reason. So unlike animals, even animals that are can do some, some kind of low-order low processing. Uh, when a wolf goes to eat, it doesn't ask, is it right for me to eat the rabbit? It doesn't debate, should I kill this rabbit? It just acts on instinct, whereas human beings are different. We can discover truth, um, and again, that's God. What is truth? It's God. Um, and we use the intellect uh, to do so. Um, what is God? He's just a mind without a body. Um, he doesn't have a body. He's not, unlike us, he's not hylomorphic. He's, he's pure spirit. Um, so because we have human reason, we ask big questions. What's the meaning of life? Um, and does God have a plan? What, the way you answer this question is going to be very important. Because if God has a plan, then that means that we need to know what it is and act in accordance with it. So this is a quote from your book. God orders, 
directs and governs the entire universe and all the ways of the human community according to a plan conceived in his wisdom and love. This word orders is important. When we say something is ordered, we use this uh, term in Catholic morality a lot. When we say something is ordered, that means it goes with the plan. So if my actions are ordered, they go with God's plan for me. If we say something is disordered, then that means it goes against the plan. So I can have actions that are disordered, um, and that would mean that they're going against God's plan. I'm doing something that goes against the plan of creation. For example, if I take another human life, uh, the plan is that God is the, God is the author of life. He gets to choose when people live and die, not me. So if I murder someone, that action's disordered. So keep this in mind because as we study morality, um, you know, people aren't disordered, but actions are. This is sort of kind of archaic philosophical terms that in our modern language can be misunderstood. When we hear the word disorder, we think of a disorder like an illness or a sickness. Um, it also sounds um, pejorative, like it's very negative. Um, and uh, just keep in mind, when we say something's disordered, it goes against the plan. Because um, this word is going to come up again and again as we study um, morality. Um, some other aspects of our spiritual nature is our free will. And this goes to the idea that we're responsible. So free will is the idea that I, again, it's an, uh, one of the faculties of the soul that I have the ability to choose between right and wrong. The opposite of that would be determinism. Determinism, and it comes in a variety of forms, for example, um, a biological determinism or an evolutionary determinism um, would argue that uh, ultimately uh, you don't make uh, choices, that it's all determined by your biology or your chemistry. Um, there's just a philosophical determinism that argues that um, free will is an illusion, that I didn't actually choose to become a teacher. The fact that I think I did is an illusion. I would have become a teacher no matter what. Um, so an obvious problem with determinism is it flies in the face of human experience. Um, also, the other problem with determinism is if everything's determined, then can we, be make, can we be held responsible for our actions? Because Christians believe that we have free will, we're responsible. Um, if I kill somebody, um, I have to be held responsible for what I did because I chose to do it. Um, if you're a determinist and you're going to argue that all of my actions are already determined then how can you hold me responsible for anything I've done? Because I didn't choose to do it. Um, choice and intention is very important in um, Catholic morality. So we reject a deterministic viewpoint. Um, we have the ability to love. Again, being created in the image of God means that because God is love, um, we can love too. Um, again, this makes us different from animals. Um, when I lived at college, I lived at USC, and there were all these um, packs of wild dogs that would roam around the neighborhoods. And um, one of the not-so-pleasant parts of walking to class was if there were a female dog in heat and a male dog came upon her, they would just start copulating and making baby dogs. They didn't love. They didn't have free will. They were governed totally based on their instincts. And when they came into contact with each other, they made it. Humans aren't like that. We have the ability to love. We have free will. We choose who we love. And so, again, this makes us different from the rest of the animals in creation. And finally, we have the capacity to grow. Um, sometimes this is something that's overlooked. By growing, we mean we can become better people. So not physically. We mean spiritually as people and as societies. So, um, you know, just because maybe I did something bad today doesn't mean I can't become a better person tomorrow. I can grow, and that's the idea. We're always going toward the ideal, which is God. He is perfect goodness. Um, and then as a society or a group, 
uh, one of the things that's been a real challenge for Catholics um, uh, in the past decade or two decades is the priest abuse scandal. Um, we look at the, uh, the church and we say, well, you know, how could we be part of an organization that uh, would allow for this abuse? But again, the church is not finished. We're growing. We're trying to become the kingdom of God, but we're not there yet. So we always have to allow um, for, for us to become better and to grow. It's part of our spiritual nature. Um, so uh, let us go on. So finally, I will show you um, this assignment was on Schoology and um, uh, it's the Butterfly Circus warm-up. I'll show you where it is in just a second, but please make sure to watch this video because it'll put the Butterfly Circus assignment into the context. And like I said, I'll show you in just a second where it's at. Um, so we talked about the idea that we're created in the image of God, that we're hylomorphic, we're both material and spiritual, and then our social nature is also super important. Human beings have to be in community with one another. And um, the activity we did for this lesson was related to the idea of feral children. And um, you don't have to necessarily watch uh, the video if you don't want to, but I was trying to make the point about how important community is for humans. And um, this is based on, again, that, that um, anthropological understanding of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're created in the image of God. God is a community. He's Father, Son, and their love is the Holy Spirit. So just like uh, God, we were created in his image. We have fathers, mothers, and their love creates children. We were meant to be in society. We're not meant to be alone. Um, and uh, again, we can't be truly human without one another. And so in order to, to show that point, what I did, I showed this video. So let me show it to you. Okay, so if we go to chapter one, Classwork and Discussions. So the Butterfly Circus warm-up. First, do this. You're going to watch this video about Nick Vukacek, and he is a motivational speaker who was born without arms and legs. The Butterfly Circus is a parable about his life. So first, I had the students watch this video, and then people put their um, different reactions here in the discussion on Schoology. Then the next thing we did was talk about um, the idea that humans are social creatures. So I showed them this link. Um, we watched this video in class. Again, you don't necessarily have to watch it, but it shows examples of children who are raised outside of human community. And basically, the idea is if a human being isn't raised in community, they can't acquire human language um, oftentimes, one of the examples in the video is the Ukrainian dog girl. Her family abandoned her because they were alcoholics and put her in a kennel, and she was raised by dogs. So um, they found her and tried to rehabilitate her, but even still, if you watch this video, you'll see an example of her running around on hands and knees and barking like a dog because she was um, raised to be a dog, not a person. And so the reason I showed this video was it was a dramatic example about the importance of being in community for normal human development. So um, that's part of the definitive characteristic of being created in the image of God. Just, just like God is a community of three persons, we should be a community of persons. So the final activity for this chapter is the Butterfly Circus. So it's right here, Classwork 1.11, Butterfly Circus. So I gave the students a hard copy of this handout. So the link is here to the video. So if you look here, Butterfly Circus, it's a 20-minute uh, short film 
And it stars Nick Vukacek. He plays um, the character named Will. And it's a beautiful study in human dignity. So we watched this in class. If you were absent, please watch it. You need to make this up um, because it was very important to um, analyzing human dignity. So watch the film, and then you need to answer these questions. If I could get it to open. All right. So here, um, answer in at least three sentences. Um, each question, how do you think Will felt when he was part of the sideshow in the first circus? In the film, Will stowed away in Mendez's circus. What differences did he discover? Um, what groups of society do the circus performers stand for? What do they have in common? Um, the film shows these members of society were seen as unproductive before they joined the butterfly circus. What happens in our society with the weakest? Is their human dignity and right to participate recognized? In what ways did some of the other circus performers change when they joined the butterfly circus? Please pick just one besides Will to analyze. Um, how did Will change? And again, be very specific. Um, people lose points where, they, where they're like vague. Um, who or what do you think Mendez is supposed to represent? And finally, the most important part, um, pick one of the questions below and then answer in at least six, six sentences. And again, be sure to use specific evidence from the film for support. This is basically our written assessment for this chapter. Every saint has a past and every sinner a future. How does this quote relate to the butterfly circus? Can we change that which is negative, or negative in our lives? If so, how? And again, make a parallel between what you're saying and the, the film. And then finally, we're created in the image of God, thus we all have inherent dignity. How is this foundational principle of Catholic moral and social teaching exemplified in the film? So if you are absent, make sure either you get the hard copy of this from me or take this, put it in notability, fill it out, save it as a PDF, um, and then email it to me. Again, this is the sort of the assessment that's going to show me how you understand human dignity. Um, one other thing uh, before, let's see, I close. So that's basically the, the lesson for uh, chapter one on human dignity. Let me just go, I'm trying to go back. Maybe, okay, how do I go back? Go back. Um, let me try, huh, okay, let's see, pardon me, I'm just trying to get back to Schoology, let's see, go, oh, let's do this then, sorry about this. Schoology. Again, I, I apologize. I'm just trying to get back to where I was. Ah! Hang on, I'm going to pause this. Okay, sorry about that. I think I got it figured out now. Okay, so let's just review. So the topic was creating the image of God. These were our classwork assignments. The warm-up, um, where we just discussed the value of a human life. Then there was the humanity how handout. Please make that up. Imago Dei in Scripture. I had mentioned that this was the, uh, besides this warm-up, this was another assignment we started with. Um, the worship aid is here. These were the scriptures we studied. It's um, really important that you read these scriptures and then answer this worship aid uh, because uh, this was the foundation the, uh, in scripture we started with. So make sure you make this up if you were absent. So you see the readings here, then the questions you need to answer. And again, um, they're hyperlinked. Whoops. They're hyperlinked right here for your convenience. 
Um, then uh, we discussed uh, the, do you do the butterfly circus warm up? We discussed the social nature of humanity. And finally, make sure you, up, you do the butterfly circus um, assignment. That was sort of part of our final assessment if you were absent. And um, additionally, if you go on Moodle to the, I mean, sorry, Schoology, Imago Day, test, quizzes and review materials. Um, we're going to take uh, a test after we study all this material and finish the butterfly circus. Um, the quiz will be in class. If you're absent, please make it up um, and just communicate with me what, when you're going to come in and when you're going to make it up. Um, so that's basically chapter one. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.